Hello and welcome to Access Chat. Uh, I'm delighted to that we can welcome Pip Jameson, uh, founder of The Dots, to Access Chat today. This is a great exercise in serendipity. Uh, Pip's just launched uh, a list of ND um, female heroes that uh, includes some of my female heroes and co-collaborators and former Access Chat guests. Um, and Pip has also been introduced to me by someone that I started my working life with, so, and also former Access Jack guest, Vicky Ross. So, uh, Pip, it's great to have you with us. It's great to have uh, another fellow neurodiverse person on Access Chat. We're fond of neurodiverse people here. Um, yeah. So, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about the dots? Yeah, so um, so yeah, I mean, I'm I'm dyslexic, so very brilliant to be with other <laughs> neurodiverse people. Um, uh, I I am the founder of a plat platform called The Dots, um, which Forbes called the next LinkedIn. Um, uh, we look after a community we like to call no collar professionals. What on earth? No collar professionals. These are like creators, freelancers, people working increasingly on a project by project basis. Um, I guess. We've got over half a million members now, and we work with around 10,000 companies that use us to hire talent. Um, but I guess at the heart of everything we do is one of the things I hated about LinkedIn is it felt like I had to be this suited corporate homogenous person to succeed. So um, a big part of the dots is um, celebrating people's differences because I that's what makes people brilliant, especially in the creative space. You know, if we're all the same, how can we think? differently. Um, so of our nearly half a million community, 68% uh, is female, 31% BAME, which stands for Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic, 16% um, LGBT, but we do a lot of work promoting neurodiverse talent, um, hence the, the collaboration with Women on Beyond the Box with the list you just mentioned, um, and also do a lot of work around socioeconomic movement as well and promoting talent that wouldn't necessarily get their foot in the door. And I guess what my mission in life is to sort of democratize the creative industries and give access to everyone. Um, and also, I guess, promote that it is our differences that make us brilliant. That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a huge thing. I think that the desire to homogenize has been um, prevalent in society for at least the last hundred years. We've gone through the industrial era uh, uh, and the manufacturing e uh, era, and essentially we've gone with the advent of computing. We've also kind of industrialized our creative processes as well. Um, and yes, uh, you know, some of us don't feel particularly um, comfortable wearing suits. I love suits, but they're not always right. And and, and <laughs> this, this they're not always right for me. You know, I'm actually in our offices today, but it's Friday, so I've managed to escape wearing one. Um, but I've been watching this series of um, it's been great on Twitter. I love Twitter. Um, and there's a series of before and after photos of kids young kids going to school and they're immaculate in one photo <laughs> and then their hair's all in the wrong place. The, I think the best one was this, this young uh, African-American girl that had a, a full-on ponytail at the start of the day and had lost the ponytail during the day <laughs> and just had this sort of sheared off top knot. And I feel a bit like that sometimes when I, you know, I, I come out of the end of a, a day when you've been sort of through a, a very formal routine. So it's great to know that there is this other community of, of creative people out there. This this latest thing that you're doing around neurodiversity, how did it come about? Well, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm dyslexic with, with hints of ADHD, dyspraxia, and autism. So um, it's been obviously a massive passion point for me. I mean, it was weird actually because I didn't think about my neurodiversity for ages, except I, um, I on my email signature it says delightfully dyslexic, excuse typos. So it was kind of a bit of a necessity because I just was sending so many emails, but I was having to get my team to proof or my husband pr to proof, and so instead of like 
trying to waste all their time, I ended up putting that signature on. And then off the back of that, people started asking me to talk about my journey as a dyslexic. And then weirdly, I started really thinking about it more and researching about it more and going, well, why, why are so many entrepreneurs dyslexic? So 35% of entrepreneurs are dyslexic and 40% of self-made millionaires. So, you know, everyone from Joe Malone to Holly Tucker, obviously Richard Branson, you know, um, Steve Jobs is dyslexic and autistic. And I was kind of very interested in why my brain was designed to be an entrepreneur. And there's actually a brilliant piece of Harvard research that actually explains that. So for example, the reason dyslexics are so creative is we have wider peripheral vision. We're taking in more data all the time. And so, and we synthesize, I mean, in the end, right, humans are the most sophisticated robots that exist. We're taking in all this information and we're synthesizing it into creative thought and gut feeling and intuition. But as dyslexics, we're taking in more information. So it means that we're kind of constantly bombarded and that's what makes us creative. So sorry, very long, long answer to what you were saying, but I guess I then became increasingly passionate about the neurodiverse space and started doing lots of talks with friends who have autism or ADHD and got really involved in amazing organizations like Creative Equals who do a lot of work here in the UK to promote um, diverse talent in the creative industries. And then I met this amazing woman called Emma um, who runs this brilliant organization called The Woman Behind the Box. Um, and Emma um, only recently found out she had ADHD and she'd seen other lists we'd done. So for example, for International Women's Day for a whole month, we only feature women on the dots and create a list. Same thing for Black History Month, we only uh, feature black talent and we create a list. And women's, um, uh, Emma basically was like, I'm creating this amazing list. Will you help promote it on the dots? And will you be on the list? And um, will you recommend a few people? And that's kind of how it all evolved. And so it was just a kind of a lovely melting of what we do at the dots all the time, but also just the fact that it's a very personal subject to me because it's, it's you know, something I'm very passionate about. <laughs> Deborah, I know you've got a question. Yes, and um, first of all, kudos. I, I love, love, love what you're doing. I love the, when women support other women. Um, it's just a passion of mine as well. <laughs> so a few questions I have is, um, is this only women or are you including, you know, the males? And I'm also wondering, is this something that you're focused on in the UK or is this a global effort? And before I... To, before I, uh, I finish, it, it's interesting because I recently came out, I, I've talked about it on, with Access Chat for years, but I came out officially and uh, at the, as I like to say, the tender age of 56 that I um, had ADHD because that's when I was first diagnosed. I'm 60 now, but it's, I've been really surprised at the reaction of my fellow Americans and because we still are in a place in the United States where um, we don't completely own our neurodiversity. We're working on it. And our, I find our younger people are doing a much better job of it than the older people like me. But I find it fascinating because obviously we all believe in Access Chat that our differences make us better. Our differences, you know, help us make the world better. So um, I'm just curious about a few of those things. And I applaud the innovation, the creativeness I continue to see coming from the UK. So I I just love what you're doing. So applause. Bless you. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in terms of the list, it is all female. Um, that's very much from a personal place of where Emma came from. Um, so yeah, like you, I'm a massive women supporting women, um, you know, female leadership across the creative industries here in UK is pretty woeful. I'm not sure what it's like in the US. Um, you know, talking personally as a female tech founder, um, only 9% of um, investment funding, um, angel funding goes to female founders here in the UK. Um, and at my level, because we closed a four million round recently, it's only 2.3% go to female founders. So I'm very passionate about getting more women up the ranks. Um, our lists are not always like that, though. So for our Black History Month takeover, it's a completely diverse list. And I, I'm a big believer in, you know, the magic of intersectional diversity. You know, my experience as a sole female tech 
dyslexic founder is very different from an experience of someone who is a BAME female founder who isn't dyslexic. So what we just try and do is create a really safe, inclusive platform where people are very comfortable to be themselves. And I think that I just always hated LinkedIn because I feel like everyone was just trying to be someone else and it wasn't a safe space where you would be very proud of your differences, which is what makes us brilliant. And that's kind of the platform we've created. Um, our, our community is very British. So while it's a half a million, it's mainly here in the UK at the moment, but I will be coming to the UK and the US hopefully soon. I mean, you can sign up from the US, but of the 10,000 companies that use us to hire, they're primarily, they're all UK businesses. I mean, they're international businesses. So like Google users, Burberry users, you know, it's a, but at the same time, it is the British like arms of those international businesses. But I promise we'll come so, to the US soon. <laughs> yes, yes, and please let me know, please let me know. Yeah. Cause, but I wonder, cause I actually really like LinkedIn. And I understand though what you're saying. I do understand what you're saying, but I wonder, is there a place for you to, um, to take the good parts of LinkedIn to support what you're doing? I mean, I, I, I like Twitter. But I like it, honestly, I like it a little less. It, it's funny, I, I liked it a lot less, and then recently I like it better. Because I actually, I thought it was very messy how they changed things, and I didn't like it, and I actually got in Twitter jail for a while. But, but at the same time, I think that they've made the platform better, but I don't like that they don't engage with, with you know, the, us people on Twitter. There's things that I really like that LinkedIn's doing now, and in the U.S., it's interesting because we are having more neurodiverse conversations on LinkedIn than we've had because there's such a huge need in the US. We need you to come over and help. So I was just curious if, it, why does it have to be one or the other? So excuse me for a hard question, but I'm I just know, wondering because it seems fine. like there's. I yeah, I don't, I think that's super fine. And it definitely doesn't have to be one or the other. I mean, our community is primarily in the creative industries. And it's been designed for that kind of community. And so I guess the big difference between us and LinkedIn is LinkedIn is based on someone's traditional CV, which is a very kind of linear career path. People who work in the creative industries and our definition and is very broad of the creative industries, but that's everything from like advertising to design, architecture, film, fashion, tech. People are increasingly working on a project by project basis. So the way the dots works is people post projects, but then they credit the full team around that project. So say an app went up, it would be this is the UI designer, this is the UX designer, this is the front end engineer, this is the back end engineer. And it's a recognition that creativity is kind of a team sport. And while the, our, I guess we're, the kind of idea was very much grounded in the creative industries, what's interesting is it's much more of, I guess, a Gen Z behavior. So we have a big Gen Z community because they're starting to work more on project by projects. They've all got side hustles. They're kind of freelancing on the side. So it's best, it's, move, it's basically designed for a more fluid project-based type of work, which is increasingly what the younger ones are starting to do. Um, so, so yeah, it was, it's, it like I'm, you know, yeah, I'd say to my community, if you're looking for opportunities, definitely be on both platforms, but our platform kind of lends itself to that project-based type of work. Um, Right, and we're a gig economy. So yeah. I, I love what you said because I know so many Gen Zs and Xs that yeah. they're working full time for big corporations, but they got a ton of side gigs. Yeah, yeah. And, so and I'm fascinated. I think it is so cool. Yeah. And well, I mean, yeah, this so is so good. Side doing. hustle, you know, and like every yes, and, and it's yes. Brilliant. And I think side hustles are so important for keeping your brain active and learning new skills and doing a podcast or your own fashion line. And yes. so it very much lends itself to that kind of community. Good job, good job. <laughs> Neil? Oh yeah, so um, I, I've got a really, I think this is a, a, an interesting question, I hope it is. Um, so you listed that you, you're, you're working with creatives and, and, and you know, we like to think that people who are neurodivergent, you know, dyslexic, dyslexic, ADHD, et cetera, are creatives. Now, um, I'm working in a behemoth of a company, one that is more suited to maybe LinkedIn than to, to, to you know, the, the traditional creative industry. How do you think that, that we as non-conformists can really thrive in these difficult 
conformist environment you know uh, what you know what what advice can you give to someone that has been a, you know a, a jobbing creative um that wants to take on a challenge that maybe because i think big companies have the opportunity to change the world right because of scale and you know buying power and all of these kind of things so that's why I'm here, right? But but at the same time, the transition from working for an SME, which I worked for before, maximum of 120 people, to one that has 120,000, was really daunting. You know, what kind of advice could you give to creatives and 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 you know, no collar workers about working in a white collar, grey suit environment? How do you say people could survive? I mean, it's tough. Funny, I was on a panel and that was one of the topics we were discussing. I mean, there's some companies here in the UK that are doing it really well. Like, actually, the reason I started speaking about my dyslexia was because Direct Line got me in the, into their business. They had a neurodiversity week and this amazing guy called uh, Mark Evans, who's their CMO, got me in to talk about it. And so there's, there's corporations or bigger businesses that are doing it really well. It is hard to navigate. Um, that's why I love kind of organizations like, you know, the other box, Creative Equals, who are, you know, there as sort of sort of support networks to to be able to share ideas and learnings. I think, I mean, it's harder for me to come at it from an entrepreneur's perspective, because I guess the reason I became an entrepreneur was because I wanted to create the new norm and I wanted to create yeah. the bigger business of the future. And I, I never, I mean, Saying that, like I did work at MTV, so it's kind of pretty, pretty, you know, pretty celebratory of sort of differences there anyway. But I, um, you know, I, well, I, when I was sort of getting older and I was like, okay, I was sort of coming out of the age bracket of MTV and I was looking around at what there was out there for me. I was like, I'm not sure I could fit this mold. And so I just wanted to invent the, a new mold. And I guess that's why so many neurodiverse legends become entrepreneurs. But I think what's brilliantly unique about the, the the time we're in now is that there are now more support networks, things like this, things that people can join and come together as a collective to discuss problems and how they can do solutions in businesses. And I think also businesses here in the UK, we're pretty much at full employment. You know, we're at the lowest levels of unemployment for so long that, you know, it is a um, it's definitely a kind of seller's market. So it's the, it's the talent's market right now. So um, there is different opportunities elsewhere, and that's about kind of finding out what are the businesses like Direct Line who are doing it in a better way. Um, and I think another way, I love the younger generation are jumping so much because I think the younger generation are sort of not tolerant for places that aren't inclusive. And it's actually what we, I mean, we work with 10,000 companies. I think what we're finding when we're talking to them is they are having to build more empathy and diversity into their businesses because uh, like Gen Z and millennials are just not tolerant if it isn't there. So they're just losing all the best junior talent. So it's definitely come onto the agenda and in a way, you know, I started the business four years ago. Since that point, no one really cared. Now it's like completely different. Everyone really cares. So it is it is changing because I think it's being pushed a lot by the younger generation coming through who just don't tolerate walking into an office and where everyone looks the same and there isn't compassion for the team and there isn't a, a recognition that different people work in different ways. They're just not tolerant of that anymore. So in millennials, I trust, I think. <laughs> and, and, and I think that is so good that the young people are saying, no, I'm not no. going to work for you if you're yeah. like that. And yeah. I don't care that I myself don't have a disability or I'm not neurodiverse. I'm not working for you because you're excluding other people. And that's just not yeah. that. I'm not going to roll that way. I love the younger generation. Yay. Yeah, and, yeah every day, and funny enough, there's some brilliant research by um, the amazing Ali at Creative Equals, and then they found um, that more inclusive teams, and when she was talking about inclusivity, it's teams that reflect society and all its kind of intersectionality, more inclusive teams are more likely to stay, it's, sorry, 43% more likely to stay with the business, and there's a massive amount of company churn these days with people leaving very quickly, and so lots of companies are like, oh my gosh, we've just got to solve this. And so I get really excited about that. But as you can tell, I'm a very positive person. <laughs> um, 
Well, uh, what you've seen is that um, uh, older organizations, organizations that are more established in the market, they tend to be more diverse, especially when you look at different generations, and, and sometimes even uh, culturally, because they are, they are more established around the world, they have offices, and they have, they have somehow people at the executive role that companies that are younger don't have. So, uh, but, but saying that, uh, this was just to comment in terms of the things that you were saying. Uh, the UK was always very strong in the creative uh, uh, industry. Now, it was always um, a country that attracted a lot of people in this space from all over Europe. So you have a very strong, if you, know, if you go around London, you see people from everywhere, you know, in co-working spaces, collaborating, uh, co-creating. So my question for you is, how can you bring the dots to, to the networks of those individuals, because they are here in London, they are in London, um, but they have their networks uh, in their native countries, who are somehow following them. So how can you somehow expand the dot outside uh, the existing network uh, uh, from the moment that they actually started to engage uh, with you? Yeah, I mean, interestingly, they're, they're doing it for us. So we have loads of different hubs all around the world. We, we kind of think about um, hubs in terms of cities um, or towns more than we do in kind of um, countries, because actually, you know, LA and New York is very different. Berlin and Hamburg is very different. So and we think about that way. We've actually got a thriving community that's starting to build mainly through Europe. Um, so for us, it's then, well, for me over the next year, it's working out, okay, so where do we actually start building kind of more the opportunities so the company's coming on board and hiring? Um, and yeah, the joy of a tech founder. So, you know, sometime next year, I'll be going to my next round of investment to start planning that international expansion, whether it's going to be Europe or the US, I'm not sure. I mean, interestingly, with creator hubs, you're right, London is actually the biggest cluster of creators in the world. It's actually bigger than New York because you've got the concentration of all the industries. You've got tech, film, fashion, advertising, architecture, design, film, all in one spot. Like New York is massive, but actually, you know, that's mainly advertising fashion. LA, it's mainly film, TV. You know, I'm obviously overgeneralizing. So the next biggest hub in Europe is actually Paris, and that's a massive aggregation as well. But there are more creators in the US, they're just more spread out to different cities. So that's what we're trying to work out at the moment is like, where do we go next? Um, and where can we bring most value for our community? Um, so yeah, but there are lots of people on the dots who are um, international, which is nice to see. I, I just wonder whether or not the, um, the creative industry being so big in the UK is partly because we've always celebrated our eccentricity here um, <laughs> and maybe that's why we're you know maybe we're a country of uh, with a high propensity for neurodiversity and acceptance of oddities because I, I you know it's it's even before we invented the terms we've always kind of celebrated our oddballs rather rather than to put them in a in a corner um, I, I guess the, the other thing is, you know, we, we talk about the, the plus sides, but, um, you know, uh, and you've talked about entrepreneurs and, and so on, but there's also a lot of people in the, in the penal system that are, are neurodiverse. How do we, do you, how do we find ways of, of flipping that narrative and getting them into roles where they can be doing something that they're good at because often it's it's through lack of opportunity um, that people have ended up in uh, one side of the the legal fence or the other. Yeah, I mean, as we all know, like you know, neurodiversity harnessed correctly is a superpower. I mean, I was so I was so lucky, I guess, because I was I was quite young when I was diagnosed, and it, I mean, this, this was in the 80s, so it wasn't dyslexia wasn't really a thing here, and it was actually because my mum was working for. A charity, an American charity actually, called New Kids on the Block, um, which used to, before the really bad band, New Kids on the Block, if anyone remembers that band. But anyway, um, my mum was working for this charity, and um, uh, this charity used to do educational puppet shows on disabilities. So she used to go around to um, primary schools 
teaching kids about um, cerebral palsy and how cerebral palsy can be a physical challenge, not a, you know, anyone with cerebral palsy is just like us. And anyway, it was while my mom found out, um, what it was while I was really struggling at school and my mom actually went to a lecture and heard about this thing called dyslexia. So I was really privileged in the fact that I got help really early. So I went to one of the first dyslexic schools. So sorry, to get back to your question, I guess I always reflect on if that hadn't happened, where would I be? Um, I mean, I still managed to get kicked out of two schools, even with, <laughs> um, even with that support. So without that support, I, there is a very fine line between. So, I mean, I think like, I, well, I mean, it's so, there's no silver bullet and it's so complex. I think obviously getting, getting kids support early and the right support early removing the biases, removing the, the prejudices. Pre is that the right word? I mispronounce words sometimes because my dyslexia, I don't know if that's the right word, but I hope you agree. But um, Fine. I, think, yeah, I think one of them, I, what I love is how people are becoming much more open um, here in the UK about their neurodiversity and lots of senior leaders. And I think that's really important because I think that helps trickle down and remove the stigma involved. And that's why I was so passionate about Emma's list you know, you've got politicians on that list. It's amazing. So I think I think we've got to be the, I, you know, not everyone's comfortable about talking about their neurodiversity and it's a very personal journey. But I think if you are, I think it's kind of, I feel like it's my responsibility to be out there saying, if I can do it, you can do it too. Um, and there are different ways. And, it, you know, it's not a walk in a park. You know, I still have lots of Lots of challenges, um, but it, the, the benefits outweigh the challenges every day. So I would never change it for the world now. Well, uh, people that work in the creative industries uh, at some level, they, some of them could be in a very fragile situation. You know, uh, working from project from project. Sometimes you know, they might be working with an agency on a specific task, and then they might work for a larger organization or another. But uh, all these organizations uh, that might be uh, uh, working with them might have different ways of paying back. You know, some organizations they pay at 30 days, uh, others at 90 days, uh, and they uh, and because they are not really adjusted to work uh, in this way with, with freelancers and creatives in an in, in a ongoing or project base. Are you doing any type of work somehow to, to find ways where organizations are able to adjust uh, also to the rhythms of the, the creatives in relation to, to, that, to that aspect of work? Yeah, so what you're explain, explaining is horrific, like the payment terms of like freelancing. I mean, I, I will say that our community aren't all freelancers. So, you know, only 41% of our community are freelancers. The rest are working in full-time roles and doing like side hustles or side projects. So I think it's a very, for the exact reasons you just mentioned there, it's a very personal journey. You know, freelancing is not for everyone because of those challenges and uncertainty. In terms of us, no, I mean, my... I see my role as opening up opportunities to everyone, democratizing talent, and making sure that our algorithm actually biases towards diverse talent, not the other way around. Um, there are lots of other organizations I know who are doing those sort of things. And then, you know, what we tend to do is kind of promote our community. So on the platform itself, we have like an ask section. Um, so this allows our community to ask questions. So it can be around, are there companies that can help with payment terms? Who are the best companies? Shall I work for this company or are they going to pay me in like eight months and it's going to be a nightmare? So we very much provide the kind of support platform where the community can help each other with these sort of challenges because some are payment, some are finding clients, some are just finding a printer, some's finding co-working space. So we are very much the platform that helps connect the dots, sorry, <laughs> I can't help it. Um, so, but we don't get into the nitty grits of like the payment because there's just brilliant people that are doing that. Okay, so, do. okay so picking up on, you just mentioned co-working. Are you connected with any of the uh, networking, uh, or network, any of the co-working organizations around Europe? 
Yeah, so actually, if you go onto the R section, you'll see all the, we've actually got a sec section which is called Studios and Co-working Spaces, and then you'll see like loads of discussions of the community around studios and co-working spaces, because it's massive here. So we have partnerships in place with people like Soho House, Protein Studio, we work with WeWork, the office group, so yeah, it's a massive kind of thing. <laughs> no, I, I, I... I mentioned that I mentioned that because the uh, we have members of the European Co-working Assembly, who are a kind of a, a org organization that connects all the co-working or uh, independent spaces across Europe. Uh, so not spaces like we work, but we're talking about independent co-working spaces. They aggregate around the European Co-working Assembly, and and they are doing they are trying to do some work in the area of accessibility. Yeah. And they, they usually attend uh, our uh, access chat, Twitter chats uh, every Tuesday. So oh, th they are a very interesting network uh, to connect because they are pretty much connected to people who manage you know, co-working space of 50 people uh, you know, across, across Europe. So they are a very, a very interesting group to, to connect and maybe to connect the dots here. Yeah. I love that because we are in an in, we're in an independent co-working space. Like, you know, we work is fine, but it, for me, I, I also like having a different space. So the space you're seeing right now is it, it's an indie. There's like 60 of us here. It's just heaven. <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> Neil, I know you need to drop. Do you want to? Um, yes. You want to ask one more qu question or comment, uh, and then no, away? no. Well, I, I, I yeah, I, I'm afraid I'm. I've been pulled into a meeting. It's one of the joys of working for big corporates. Um, but no, I just wanted to say thanks to Pip, and, and I'm actually really looking forward to the, the Q&A on Twitter. I think it's going to be fun, and uh, I'm sure this is the first of several conversations. I don't think it's going to be the last. So thank you, Pip. It's been a real pleasure. It's so lovely to see you all, and um, good luck with the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll be fine. Yes. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Neil. Uh, so, Bye. Pip, we, oh, sorry, you know, we really do love, yeah, we really do love the, the work that you're doing and how you're tying it all together. And I have <clears throat> a couple of very large creative clients in the United States, and they are really struggling. I remember one of them was saying to me, you know, so many of our creatives are, they didn't use these words, neurodiverse, Deborah, they have a bipolar, we we uh, see, you know, dyslexia, ADHD, all these different things with, you know, autism and people are starting to want to come out more and talk about who they are, but it's still a little bit taboo here in the United States. It's, it's very interesting what is happening and we are looking at what the UK is doing and we're saying, well, if they're doing it and they're doing it so successfully and innovatively, why can't we do it here? So I had one of these big uh, creatives come to me and say, we need to like create a program for mental health and mental illness and mental wellness. And, and I, I was listening to the things that you were doing and it's so clever and I had no idea y'all were doing that. And so I'm very eager to talk to you about bringing it to the United States. And, and I think once again, that what LinkedIn does, it seems to be very different from what you're doing, very different. So it, it's, uh, it's very exciting to see y'all being so creative. And some of the, you mentioned the report earlier. I would love to see that report. So if you don't mind sharing that link, and we could actually share it with our, our listeners too, but I had no idea. I'm so glad that uh, we found out about what you're doing because I vote for the United States, not Europe, but the Europeans might say, <laughs> <"Don't stop." laughs> But it's very exciting and I love the energy that is coming. Um, yeah, and I think so. it's, um, it's just been, it's been, and it, it's it's pretty new here in a way, you know, it is only the last two years and, you know, it was just a couple of quite high profile organizations started doing a few conferences and getting really high profile senior people to talk about it. And then it kind of, it just became a bit more safe and it just, and then it was, yeah, it's just been, it's been magical to kind of like, you know, just start bringing your help, a lot of, uh, the rhetoric in the UK is about, you know, bringing your whole self to work and that, that can be corporate right, jargon, right. but I feel like people really are wanting that to happen and I, I, agree. I get excited about that. So it's kind of, yeah. And we're seeing that too in the US, but 
often, I believe employees, um, they do not feel they can really truly bring their whole self to work in the United States. And they can probably in some companies or some sections of companies better than others, but I, I just love the way everything is being changed and disrupted. And so so I just I love the work you're doing, and um, I know I, I know that we want to take the time to um, thank our supporters, um, Barclays Access, MicroLink, MyClearText. These are amazing supporters that help us keep Access Chat going. It's amazing, Pip, but we are almost five years old. In December, we are going to be five years old doing Access Chat every single week. It's amazing, and we we kept thinking, Antonio, remember that we were going to run out of topics, and instead. We keep having these fabulous <laughs> conversations like what you're doing. And, and I had no idea. I, I see so much innovation coming from Europe and the UK. It's very exciting. And um, I, I love what you're doing. And Antonio, I don't know if you want to ask Pip another question and then we'll give her the final floor. But um, no, I, I, was, I was just saying that no, it, it, just uh, following the floor of the conversation that and uh, one of the person that I've seen doing a very starting this type of conversations in UK was Kate Nash from My Purple Space. Yes. Uh, Kate was one of the persons that uh, that started this. Uh, but I also have been observing a lot of interesting work done from Germany where uh, the University of Munich releases a series of studies. Uh, in terms of uh, diversity, and uh, they put a, a very strong uh, emphasis on cognitive diversity. And, uh, and later, uh, this was picked up by Boston Consulting, who ended up using this uh, study in one of their papers uh, in order to highlight that uh, uh, diverse companies uh, uh, usually perform better uh, uh, business-wise, and they were somehow creating a case for, uh, they were actually creating a business case for for diversity. It was actually, this study from BCG was one of the first that they were presented a kind of a, a solid, why why you sh should you work and put diversity on the, on the agenda, but we're talking about different aspects of diversity, and they actually they were ma making the case for diversity within the enterprise and large business. Oh, it's amazing, and there's so much, so much growing. What I'll do is I'll send you that, and I'll also, uh, you should definitely meet Emma, who works um, at Woman Beyond the Box. And and the list, basically, will be now your hit list for chats. <laughs> okay. Yes, I, I agree. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to know about it, and I'm going to go register right away, uh, because it sounds like you're my community, so I'm very excited. So. So be, before we before we go off air, tell us how tell us what your URL is. Where where can people find you on social media? I know we're gonna we're gonna do that um, with the marketing we do, but let's go ahead and get that on air too. Yeah, so I'm hoping our SEO is pretty good. So put in the dots in Google, and we should be there. Um, if not, it is the hyphen dots dot com. But like last time I was in the US, I searched the dots, and we were there, which is great. Um, yeah, and good. Um, our app is available um, on iOS, but only in Europe. I'm so sorry, we're not in the US yet. Okay. Funnily enough, I was actually That's out okay. of Apple, but we're um, so we were we were actually working with Apple at the um, amazing like crazy Copatina thing recently. But and they're trying to convince me to launch in the US, but we're not quite ready yet. But it is available in the iOS store. Um, but yeah, if you if you can't search through SEO, then it's the hyphen dots dot com. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work. It's We love featuring leaders like you that are changing the world. So thank you. Thank you, Pip. Thank you. Really pleasure to be involved. Lovely to meet you both. Yes. And thank, we, thank you. It'll be fun on Tuesday as we chat about it. So thank yeah, you so much. See you later. Bye. <laughs>